The reason that um, I fight for environmental justice because uh, have you ever heard of uh, the silent killer, the air, the water? Through the community, people complaining of asthma, various heart conditions, all these things have been reported and have somewhat been overlooked. Everyone was upset because we had seen people get coming down with cancer, but we did not have the answers. Because nobody thought it was important and nobody thought it was dangerous. Everybody thought that the community was just hollering about nothing. The time we got the media attention is when we had the explosion. And that's when the media attention came. Environmental justice was a new new word in the 90s, and environmental racism, a, a, a waste and race in the United States in 1987, the, the study that came out. So that is, it was a new concept to me, is a name. It was not a new concept to me at all whatsoever as far as segregation is concerned. And, and uh, there's things in the past that were, that were related to overall segregation that, that has resulted in people being impacted far more than other people uh, by things like uh, factory placement, dump, uh, landfill dump placement, uh, typically your most obnoxious uses, and you can just see it all over Memphis, was placed near the black community. This little community right here was one of the first neighborhoods that I worked with when I first started doing environmental justice work at the Peace and Justice Center. Everybody in their neighborhood has a strong sense of place. If you grown up here, your family grew up here, you went to church here, you went to school here, you have a strong sense of community. When I would go down there in the past, I had allergies and all sorts of problems, like many Memphis as it was. But you would get a taste in your mouth of the chemical from the chemicals. This is sort of what we call the chemical corridor of North Memphis. Within a three mile radius of Douglas Community Center, there used to be uh, five different polluters. Even today, their legacy is still here and it will be here for probably the next thousand years. The entire route of, of Cypress Creek is contaminated and, that's the, and that means the backs of people's yards uh, and apartment complexes from Midtown, basically all the way to the Mississippi River. That company right there is the Southern Cotton Oil Company. They process cotton seed. They produce one toxic chemical substance called hexane gas. They are the largest producers of hexane gas in the city. And that company was another one that right across the street from their entrance, right across the road, were homes. This is a community group that I grew up in. Uh, some people call it Dixie Heights. Uh, this creek right here is the creek that runs through the neighborhood and uh, brought contamination and runoff from the Defense Depot site. What happened in our community was really nothing new. It happens in many of the inner city communities. So it, it's just a matter of them taking advantage of individuals that they feel won't fight back or don't have the power or the influence to deal with these large companies. And that's why we have to continue to, you know, fight these battles. When the book was opened, as it were, in the 80s, you can sit there and look at it. You go, well, well when you go went by Velsicol or the, the, uh, a drum recycling place or Valero or gasoline plant, you wonder, why are those homes built right there? Well, that's the way it was set up. That was a segregated neighborhood. Can I change that? No. Can I do something to make it better? Maybe, yes. And can I work with others who feel the same way? Yes, I can definitely do that. One of our community members lives in this neighborhood. 
and his community group was fighting a company called American Resource and Recovery. Okay, uh, I'm from the Southwest area of Memphis, which is near uh, the Longview Heights area. We were semi trying to get a hold on the environmental problems in the Southwest area, which we are plagued by them. Um, you know, uh, the oil company, uh, Great Dame, or we had uh, refined metal. So we had a lot of uh, different issues going on in that area. Ralph White at Bloomfield Baptist Church uh, put together this fight. This was one of the first fights that he got involved in was saving Martin Luther King Park. Yeah, well, there had been ongoing problems there, problems with bed sicknesses, people with heart conditions, breathing, all of that was very prevalent and evident. It was just something that the community had enough to know. In our neighborhoods, for some reason, we seem to have to put up with all of this mess, these chemicals, these fumes, and then 20 years later, we want to know why our people are dying from cancer and stuff. And it's because people that are in power won't listen at poor black people. If you can notice how close that fence line is to folks' backyards, you see, you can see the houses easily through there. 901 East Bottom. Perfix and AR&R was a hazardous waste recycling plant. And this hazardous waste recycling plant, you know, played a role. I mean, they took in all types of different toxic waste. They re-blended them and uh, found a way to reuse them. But the problem was they were on the fence line of homes. They had storage tanks that sit on the ground. And in, in the process of them sitting on the ground, they decayed under the bottom and some of the chemicals were seeping into the ground too. And at one time they had storage tanks backed up against the fence line. And um, one day the storage tanks exploded. They didn't have a, a plan, an evacuation plan. Uh, they sent city buses over here to try to uh, take some people away. There was black smoke all in the air. One of our community members was arrested from sta for standing on the sidewalk trying to take pictures of the smoke. Uh, and our organization went down and got him out of jail. Um, and so it was just a really big fight with that company there. Uh, Mayor Harrington said that it would never open under his watch again, and it didn't. Sierra Club hate, likes to take people out to, you know, see nature and enjoy and learn to love a place. And essentially, we we're there to learn about the place, but, but through the people. Any kind of permit that came up, there's usually a public comment period in there. We did teach something about air quality monitoring, financed some, getting some equipment for very picky people take your own samples and that sort of thing. Basically, the Sierra Club helped us organize and to force to reckon with, because you know, everybody running every kind of way, it don't work, so. <laughs> and so we tried to make people understand that, you know, even though we're coming into this fight with basically nothing, uh, you know, we, it's possible that we can win. I appreciate the sweet love of Ms. Patterson and all the folks here from the Sierra Club, the NAACP, and the Southern Alliance. These are three outstanding organizations which are coming together for an important initiative that America and the world needs to take to protect our environment. The toxic tours have been good, and, have, and a lot of people will say, you know, I really didn't know a whole lot about all of this until you gave it, took us on a tour. Not only the close proximity to commu of communities to a lot of these facilities, 
but how many burdens that these communities have. You've got the train tracks, you've got Superfund site, you've got numerous chemical companies, you've got a polluted river, you've got a six lane uh, interstate highway. So uh, environmental justice communities don't really just have one issue to deal with, they have many. And when I left off the junkyard, I mean, it's, it's just a lot of different, um, a lot of different issues. A lot of times our victories are not exalted the way we would like to have had them, but um, we have had some victories and some things just don't exist that used to exist. Uh, the lead smelter, it's done, it's gone. WNR drum, gone, and I'm glad it's gone. The biggest company that we found ourselves at odds with over the years was the Velsico Chemical Company. And Velsico has been shut down that's pretty much uh, erased from the landscape, and that's a good thing. I'm glad I played a part in making those things go away. You know, people just felt like they, you know, they needed to fight, and that was one of the things that we tried to instill in communities when they realized they had a problem, is that, you know, even though these companies have a lot of money and they have attorneys and can cover for themselves, communities have power too.